All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a very quick uh, setup for a panel discussion. So we are going to get the panel to walk in as I introduce them as well. Uh, so we can send in the panel right now to take their seats. And we would like to ask the panelists to please take their seats according to the order uh, that will be displayed on the screen in just a moment. Uh, can we send the panelists in? Our next panel is about redefining leadership for digital economy. COVID-19 has accelerated the shift towards digitalization. It has forced companies to adapt and change the way they operate almost overnight. Uh, I'm just going to call an audible cue for our panelists who are, I think are outside and they're about to step in. Could we have you come in immediately, please, and take your seats? Our next panel is moderated by uh, Sriram Iyer, who's the Global Chief Operating Officer in Digital Business at ANZ Bank. Uh, on this panel is Dr. Wolfgang Bayer, who's the Group, Group Chief uh, Executive Officer of Lux Asia. Michael Goritz joins us back on stage as well for this discussion, as does uh, Chan Sao Chiong, San Chao, uh, sorry, Chang San Xiong, uh, Chief Executive Officer, SP Digital, SP Group, and Benny Xia, Vice President, Southeast Asia and Korea. V E E A M. Could you welcome our panel with a round of applause, please? Thank you. Mike, four. All yeah. right. All right. Thank you all again. Thank you, CIO Academy, for organizing this. For me, my day is already made. Just one and a half hours, and it's fantastic. I'm very nervous. I've not done this in two years. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, and a warm welcome to our overseas uh, delegates uh, from different countries. Now, the, the purpose of this discussion, which is probably for about 35 minutes, and I think we have time for a few questions, uh, is to try and extract the leadership implications of digital transformation. And Rama spoke about this when he opened. Uh, Robin, fantastic uh, presentation, and you touched upon leadership uh, in your own slides. And if you have read the profiles of the panelists here, uh, it's mind-blowing, and I wish we had three hours and not 30 minutes to, to try and extract some lessons. So I'll try and do my best and uh, discuss what each of them have learned on the topic of leadership in this digital world. So I'm going to start with Dr. Wolfgang, who I hope you are familiar with who he is and uh, what Luxatia is. Uh, doctor, the way I, I work for a bank and the way I reflect on what has happened is, uh, I read somewhere, this is the new WWW work, workforce and workplace all have changed in the last uh, two years or so. Now you have built your business on omni-channel for your luxury brands, uh, particularly in this region. And I'm keen to know, and if you can share with the group, what your own leadership approach has been in how you have adapted the company on this omni-channel path, particularly at the very high end of what you, what you offer as a product. We're very happy and uh, happy to be here. I think same for me. It's been ages since we were getting together and I think just being in a room with, with, with people is already great, you know? So very happy to, to share a few thoughts. I think when you think about omnichannel, and we talked about it before, it's actually leadership in an omnichannel environment. It's about leadership in a digital environment. So it's not so much the digital leadership. I think it starts really with the we. There is no me anymore. That there is not that individual. It's teamwork, it's we as how we work together. You know, I was lucky that in you know, the first time I talked about digital transformation is almost now 11, almost 12 years ago. And I think since then, you know, it became clearer and clearer that as a CEO, as, an, uh, as someone in the executive board, you really don't know much, you know? It's about people leadership, it's about getting the right people, it's about making sure they work together. So the first one is really the we, you know? Mm -hmm. So understanding that you cannot 
do any strategy, you cannot lead it by yourself. It's always the team around you. I think the second point is very much, what do you then do as a leader, you know? And I think in my humble view, it's really making sure that your vision that you put out is purposeful. It's not just a vision that speaks to, to, to your mind, but it's a vision that speaks to your heart. It's something that people believe in. That's something that people wake up, that the people are willing to work that extra hour. It's about the people really getting into it and understand this is why we're doing it. So the why is so much more important than the what now. And then it's about basically finding the right characteristics, the mindsets, by role modeling them, by rewriting the values of your company. You know, topics like courage, topics like grit, topics like teamwork. Those are the things that leaders now need to, to show in order to really get to the next level. And then as a leader, I basically make sure that there's an ecosystem in place, that those leaders that come in place and all our staff can really flourish, can do what they want. There's a fail fast, learn fast mentality, there's courage taking, there's grit, and there's absolute support, you know, that people can experiment and innovate. And so that's basically kind of the role that I see in leadership now in the digital world, because it is changing so fast, and we heard that before, that if you go down with a very strict path and say, this is today and this is where we're going to be, most likely you won't. So it's much better to create a framework and guidepost for people to walk in there and, and, and unleash them like speedboats to get the best out of it. Oh, thank you. I mean, you, the way I read your comments were you touched upon the what uh, in, in a, and the why. Part of the how is also this aspect of adapt, adaptability and resilience. And particularly in businesses like yours, I, I guess, you know, supply chain disruption, for example, is, must be massive. So how did you, from a leadership point of view, how did you anticipate and respond to the supply chain disruption challenges? I think it's something that, that we had to do very early on, you know, because, you know, when we saw the pandemic started, uh, we sat down at the board um, and we basically decided to, to, to react immediately. You know, so it was back then, uh, Chinese New Year 2020, you know, when we basically got all our plans already started, you know, so we were lucky, for example, in the supply chain, we were already running 300 e-commerce stores. So we immediately kind of started shifting people in, into that area to drive the, the, the frontline growth, to drive revenues. We knew that supply chain will be compromised. So we shifted capabilities from B2B in our warehouses to B2C. We knew there would be supply shortages. So we looked through all our assortment and basically made sure that the best sellers are all in place. So what we saw is that the whole supply chain function and the whole disruption to the consumer angle, it meant that we need to go from just a, a view of a function into really making it the brain of the whole company. You know, cross-functional thinking, forward thinking, and lots of data. You know, what we started to do is really gather data from the end consumer to the supplier and vice versa. And as you know, at the beginning, when you start collecting data, data you're more confused than, than, than really helpful because you get a lot out of it and you, look, you stare at it and have, have no clue. That meant that we also had to beef up those resources, those departments, get great people in that could make sense of data, could basically cut them down into insights. And with those insights, we went out and we were lucky to maneuver very, very early. And I think that gave us an advantage because a, a lot of the reactions that I saw was basically end of 2020 and some even kind of early 2021. That we were already six months into having weekly huddle on an operational level with all the leaders where we say, what do we have to change? What are the key data we monitor? And what are the implications of the pandemic coming ahead? Right. So really, hardcore execution focus as often as possible. Of course, I'm simplifying it. Thank you for those comments. Michael, I'm going to speak with you on this topic of agility and... Uh, by the way, the cloud presentation was superb. And, and it felt to me that you have adopted your agile approach just in your cloud transformation alone, apart from a broader, broader context, in a broader context. You yourself were in Mercedes-Benz and then you moved to banking. If that is not agility, then you know I was thinking myself. And I was reflecting on Robin's presentation about bureaucracy and I work for a bank which is again 180 years old and I tend to call it as minimum viable bureaucracy. We've got to get things done. So how did you adapt your leadership you know, approach to make sure that you're agile in Standard Chartered for, I don't know, 45 odd countries that you have now? Did you, did you reflect on it and how did you move the company from an agility point of view?
Oh, here. Oh, you got your... Take that one. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, well, the, the, the one thing which, when, when COVID struck, I mean, we were actually locked down and we were not able to meet. Yeah? And, and, and then, obviously, it needs a lot of leadership in a, in a diverse, distributed organization like ours to, to keep the people together. Yeah? And um, specifically, the, 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 the agile... Um, routines which we had, like huddles and all this kind of things. Uh, all of a sudden, we had to do in a, in a virtual environment, uh, which is a little bit harder. You know? But if you say, guys, this is still important to do this, uh, so we found relatively quickly some ways and tools and means uh, in order to, to transfer what we have been doing before uh, mm -hmm. in, in the new yeah. environment. So I, I wouldn't say... Uh, but, but first of all, uh, your question was, so how would we do it in, in the first place? Uh, well, in the first place, we said we have to go into agile development, and, but not only us as a technical um, organization, but the whole bank had to transform. So we introduced what we call new ways of working, uh, which is actually going away, or actually Robin uh, touched on it, it's, it's going away from a waterfall approach. So uh, the business guys say something, and then the technical leaders say they just have to fulfill. We went into a much more rapid uh, feedback cycles with um, uh, quarterly refinement uh, forums and all these kind of things. Uh, so the, 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 the modern way of, or the Spotify or whatever way of, of doing the business. And... Um, we shifted the organization into that one. So um, having these leaders between tech and ops, uh, between tech and business uh, to, to work on, on joint targets and refine your ideas going forward. Actually, what's interesting, um, while we saw that a lot of this agility applies to many of the areas, there are still a few things which you cannot do agile. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a large-scale transformation, in our case, when we upgrade a core banking system from one to the other version, I mean, there's not, nothing agile in there. Yeah? You know, you do it in 13 months, yeah? and it's 13 months, and it's at the budget, and that uh, quality, or the outcome we want to have. So I think the real wisdom is to distinguish where an agile methodology would apply and where you actually should, uh, should stick to the old traits of a, of a waterfall or more structured planning. Yeah? And... This is, I, I, I wouldn't claim that we have, we, we, we've done it right, yeah? but we, we are getting there uh, in optimizing uh, the way. Thank you. And I suppose there is the agile methodology when it comes to technology and the way of doing things, and there is the mental agility from a leadership point of view of how you, you know, motivate and run companies. And as Robin said, it's more about people than, than technology itself. Which brings me to another related point, Michael. You, you work for a big bank, you're top of the house, you sit at the table. How do, you, how do you present and communicate to the boards? And Dr. Wolfgang spoke about the word purpose. When you articulate purpose and match release of investments, and Robin said, you know, in that company, he had a blank check, and so he could go ahead and do what they like uh, with great outcomes, but that's not always the case. So how did you adopt a leadership approach to communicating to boards and convince them, convincing them on your agenda? To be honest, this for, for most of the techies in the room, that's the hardest part of the story. And, and you have to have kind of two phases. One phase is you, you, you talk to the techies and you are down there in the machine room, get their attention, and then you, you go to the board and the board does want to know totally different things. Huh? They are concerned about risk about profitability, yes. they are uh, concerned about uh, how fast can you do this. Yeah? And the, the trick of the trade is then to, to express this in, in layman terms, uh, no disrespect to the board, but often they don't have a technical expertise. So, and, and this only goes well if you have a kind of a certain confidence or trust from the board. Mm. And now the question is, how do you get that trust? And I showed on page two or three, I, I showed my pyramid. Uh, and this pyramid, I call it the mission pyramid of IT. Uh, you can call it, you, you're all familiar with the Maslow pyramid of essential needs, uh, where you have to have air, and then something uh, to, to eat, then you have security, and then it ends up in self-awareness. So in IT, it's a different thing. In IT, is you have to start with security and compliance, then you have to you add on stability, then you add on efficiency, then you add on effectiveness, and then it comes to digital transformation. If you don't deliver on the lower levels, you are never invited to the top table. 
So if your systems are not stable, if you have issues with the regulators all the time because you have security problems, I mean, you're just not hurt. I mean, you're, you're sent back into the basement and say, hey, do your shit. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But if you, if you actually deliver on the, lo on, the, on, the, on, the, on the basic levels, then the people trust you and they say, well, maybe we try with you to do a real digital transformation. Mm. And I, it, this is a longer, longer process. Yes. This trust is not built in a second. So don't try to be the genius coming in as a CIO in an organization and say, hey, I rip it off, I do the digital transformation. And behind you, the, the infrastructure is crumbling and uh, you do just, you are in a no-win situation. Oh, very powerful, and that's where the challenge is mixing and maintaining consistency of a well-managed business and then topping it up with funding for digital you know, agendas. So let me, thank you, let me move to Sarshan and ask you about your business, which is so intensely competitive, it's got opened up, it's, it's got challenges uh, from the digital side and SP. And, uh, and there's no conversation on leadership without the word culture. And uh, I tend to call it as human-centered leadership as opposed to design. So on the, on the front of culture and your circumstance as a business, which is really hampered, not hampered, sorry, exposed to competition, how did you approach the point of culture and cultural change before digital change? Sure. Uh, yeah, so... Um I think the uh, utilities and uh, power industry is uh, kind of kind of different from a lot of other industries, but uh, at the same time, it's very much the same. Uh, at a at a base level, you you are um, it is run by people, although there are a huge number of assets that are uh, owned by the organization. Uh, but fundamentally, it's not self-running, so you do need to have people to to drive it and to monitor it to operate it. And therefore, people becomes a base level of what you, what you do. Um, but the culture of the people are very different. Right? Um, and uh, I was explaining to someone earlier uh, in, in this uh, uh, event that uh, the culture for a utility company, it's uh, in fact the, the opposite of uh, where I used to be. I, I used to be at PayPal, uh, a tech company. And um, in software, a lot of things are, are run, and, uh, and you know the, the business is driven by, by people. Um, but in the business of utilities, it's actually about owning assets. So it's about owning equipment. Right? So if I look at the, uh, the business unit that I run today, SP Digital, my business are run mostly by people. We develop software, we sell our software products. Of course, I also run the... Uh, the uh, now with a new role, I also run like the uh, the IT part of uh, the business or uh, overall business. But fundamentally, it's all done by people. But if you look at the other business units, like the power grid, for example, the uh, services team, uh, the district cooling, it is all about owning the large assets. So the mentality of the people are very different. So we start talking to people about how do you do digital transformation. And then your focus is going to be very different from the focus of the people who are just basically asset owners. They own assets, they operate assets, which is the, the other big point, right? Because um, in software, we are talking about building software, we're talking about selling software. All of these are, are not physical assets. And uh, we are talking about creation. We are talking about uh, you know, software. Uh, but in the utilities world, it's about operating the equipment. Again, making things uh, reliable and uh, basically rolling out and managing the operations of uh, equipment. So again, the, the mentality is very different. Now, how do you bridge these two things together? It's actually very different and it's very difficult to, to do that. And um, I think for me, um, the way that I approached it is really focusing on the, the people. And because fundamentally, or whether you own assets and operations and you have people to develop software and to operate software and so on. Fundamentally, it's about the people. And uh, you have to bring the people along. And um, that's, for me, a fundamental approach where how do I bring people along in the journey and to make sure that they have a role and a uh, place in the, uh, the journey and wherever we are heading. Right? Uh, again, for the utility industry, the kind of profile of people um, 
who operate, who are the, uh, the field workers and engineers, and the people who go down to the field, do inspection, the technicians, and so on. Their, their needs are very different from, say, a software developer uh, who, in this new market, right, they can actually go to any other company. Whereas, like, if you are a, a meter reader in an uh, industry, that's a very different kind of uh, field that you're doing. So how do we actually bring people together and uh, to understand where the goals are and where the company is heading. I think that's, uh, that's where I'm heading, um, and that's where I drive a lot of the activities I do. Right. And, and Sarshion, when you reflect on the past, let's say recent past, from a people point of view, and you use the word mentality a few times, you use the word utility a few times, so it's quite different, I can imagine. If you look back, from a leadership point of view and culture and getting people along, would you do something different today to what you did then? What are your reflections? Um, I, I'm still doing, so I'm still learning on, on the way, even though I have been within, uh, with SP for the past six years and uh, I am still learning. Um, I have uh, recently picked up a new portfolio uh, with new team members who are of a uh, different background, right? So uh, I'm also dealing with the different new, different systems. And again, the, the approach to uh, doing things is, is quite different. Uh, let me give you an example. We were in a, a meeting, and this is one of the leaders of the new organization that uh, I've sort of like uh, picked up uh, in the past couple of months. And we were talking about how do we do a cloud strategy? How do we do a cloud migration? The guy basically raised his hand and said, no cloud, you know, we cannot go to the cloud. And said, why not? Uh, yeah, our regulators will not allow us to go to the cloud. And say, but um, actually what we are talking is about how do we build a private cloud for ourselves, right? And uh, that we are able to scale um, our processing and, and so on. And then, then the light bulb sort of turned uh, within him and said, oh, okay, so we are talking about on-premise. And okay, that's fine. Right. So the thinking behind a lot of these things has to be changed to a new kind of um, vocabulary as well. I think, uh, uh, and, and that actually is a process that I'm still going through. Um, I think talking to, to both internal people and my peers and external people, again, like the expectations for my peers now is a little bit different. Um, previously, I was running my business unit and we were uh, going out to, to sell our software and also uh, servicing our uh, internal and external customers. The uh, focus has really been like, you know, what's the, uh, what's the revenue? What is our p and right. Now it's, uh, the focus is on how do I make my grid more reliable? How do I service my customers even better, both internal and external? So again, the language changes. Uh, the focus doesn't really change as overall uh, organization, SP as organization, but I think the different parts of the organization that needs to be serviced now uh, looks at the uh, things a little bit differently. Right. Therefore, um, my thinking and my leadership uh, team also needs to change in the way they think and approach things. Right. It's very useful and I'm, I was very pleased to see that four quadrant cloud transformation slide of Michael. Uh, including the initial failures, so that was a very good comment, and it sort of resonates in the way you speak about how you've tried to, you know, teach or learn as you go forward. Thank you. Let me go to Benicia, who uh, I'm hoping you noted he himself is a, shall I say, a coder, ex-CIO, and now runs the company, and you know, it's a it's an organization since 2006 on the topic of data. There's no conference which you can hold without the word data in it, and this is vital. Uh, and what you have seen, Benny, from, from what I read, is a, a vision of what trends have taken place on the topic of data and security and uh, you know all of those topics over the last roughly 15 years. And so, as a leader, when you think of the technology trends in your world and in your space relating to data, what comes to your mind which will be useful for the audience to learn from? Yeah, very good question. And before I answer that, really, really excited to meet so many people <laughs> physically, right? Uh, I think we're so tired about uh, all the Zoom and the team meetings. But very good questions. If you look into the recent trends uh, in the industry, I mean, the top couple that really still uh, 
It's been around for the last few years. It's around data analytics, machine learning, autonomous robotics, security. Uh, but if you look at those top trends from a slightly different angle, right? Uh, look at why are they always the top trends from the attributes that make them the top leading billboard, right? Really, if you, if you look from the other angle, it's, I'd like to highlight maybe three points there, right? One is a whole lot of them actually are driven or have the attributes of software-defined and data-enabled, right? Secondly, it's around having APIs, right? Whether it's uh, yeah, open APIs and also in the community. And the third is around really orchestration and automation because that, that speaks to scale. If I go back to the first point about software-enabled and uh, data-driven, software-enabled needs no explanation, right? It's basically software that has the technology and whatever that you fill in the blank that uh, the technology does, but basically able to drive the technology um, regardless of the platform that it's on, regardless of the infrastructure that it's on, right? I think the acceleration comes in when you, and you, you, you put that software enabled with data, data analytics on top, right? So a very good example would be, especially in the world that we operate, it's how do you then protect your data? And we were having a side conversation with Michael earlier on. How do you protect your data uh, so that it is future-proof and you don't have to babysit it all the time, right? So it's, it's more uh, behavioral-based uh, policies versus just role-based, traditional role-based type policies, right? right? And then if I go into APIs, I think it's not new anymore. A lot of organizations use API, a lot of vendors use API, but there's two parts to it, right? I think when you want to uh, go in the digital transformation, APIs does help a whole lot especially the open APIs to be able to work with other technology vendors of your solution platforms. But if you really want to scale, I think that's where you need to leverage the open community, right? right. Because uh, it's not just, we don't always believe that we have the brightest mind in the organization. You want to leverage the open community, right? And that example will be best seen, I think, my, a lot of speakers touch on it, especially in the dev DevOps world where you have microservices and containers uh, where you, the, the bigger community is driving a lot of the activities. Right, right. And Benny, if, if you, I mean, you help many companies in their path to transformation, but backed by data fundamentally. And then if you think about the top of the house of digital leadership imperatives, in your experience with your clients and otherwise, what, what would you like to call out as what you'd like to see among top leaders as they start to, you know, get convinced with what your propositions are? Yeah, very good question also. I'll probably break it into two. Uh, one, I think I'll, I'll steal a page from our first speaker, right, uh, Robin, that talks about being a leader, I think, especially in this age where um, there is, if you look back, there is very little case study to see the new environments that we're getting into, the new use cases that we're, because we are the forefront of it, right? So being the last to speak, I think as a leader, I think that's very, very critical because you want to learn what has happened. You want to also let the views to come out so that then you can then as a leader then kind of normal, I guess, harmonize the, the, the discussion and also pick which are the best ideas that you want to go out and execute, right? right. Um, the second part of the question in terms of what, uh, you know, what, what type of uh, imperatives that we see, I'll flip the question uh, slightly a little bit because we actually did a study, we've been doing this study uh, for the last three years and it's, it's one of the largest data protection trend uh, it's available, if, if you link me on LinkedIn, it's available on my LinkedIn website. Um, it essentially polls 1,800 odd customers over the last three years, and we ask them very uh, digital transformation questions, right? And the one that really links to the question there was that, what was the, instead of imperatives, what was the inhibitors of digital transformation, 
right? The top three that came out in the last three years, always number one, two, three. Number one was really, I think a lot of them was inhibited by a lot of legacy application that's still, that is still in the organization, mm. right? Uh, Shireen talked about moving out of a mainframe. I know many, 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 many banks that would never touch that, right? So, legacy systems are actually not set up for the digital transformation uh, age, right? Second, it's always followed by actually the lack of skill sets, right? Because a lot of this, as I said, we are in the forefront of developing something. So a lot of times you actually have to train your people up rather than go out there and just get people in, right? Lastly is, I think it was also brought up, is around it's buy-in from senior management, mm. buy-in from the board, because uh, you are going in a different route, in a different place, uh, to a different place. It is sometimes you need to articulate that vision repeatedly, right? And, and to Michael's point, in terms of building that fundamental trust first, uh, that is very crucial. Well, that's very powerful, and I, I actually had a related question, but you ended up covering that too, which was the use of data and AI and related you know, transformational toolkits. How, how companies, in the way they are led from the top, how the use of data and all that has become a challenge now, and, and you spoke about the buy-in from the board, which is what I was um, heading towards. Let me come to Dr. Wolfgang and ask, if you don't mind, you know, he spoke about skills on leadership. When you, let's say, hire or when you're trying to get people onto your company, what kind of skills do you look for these days in the context of leadership and digital? I think the, the, the first point that you rightfully pointed out, it, it's about leaders. Right. And the first thing is, you know, the, the, the digital is secondary. The first one is, is it a leader, he or she a leader, that is ready to, to take on challenges, lead people to the next level? you know, as a CEO, you entrust those people to really make sure they're taken care of, they're empowered, and they go into that direction. So the first one is clearly about leader. On the second one, when it then comes to the digital position, it's very much, you know, I always see a spectrum between digital dreamers, people who dream up things and are fantastic and very innovative, and then the, the business-minded technocrats. I think it needs to be something in the middle, you know, where we basically say kind of, you know, you need to have the ability to dream, but at the same time, you need to be able to bring it down. You know, you need to bring kind of the horsepower down to the road and really get going and make things happen, especially in corporations, you know, that also look at returns, that, that look at kind of revenue things. So, so just the dreaming part would not do. <clears throat> and, and then last but not least, when, when you would kind of uh, really focus on three characteristics, the first one is the ability to work with teams and within teams, the humbleness. We talked about it a lot before. The second one is courage. It's so important to have courage, to come out with ideas that maybe you already know that most people don't like, but you still present them and you still pursue them because you're convinced that this is the right thing to do. And the last one is grit, because we know kind of grit, grit, grit. Uh, resilience. Because, you know, we know very much kind of, you know, when I just think about the journeys that I've been in kind of from Singapore Post to Lux Asia and some startups, we never ended up where we thought we would end up. You know, and, and there were a hundred roadblocks around, but we always went on. I think that was really kind of the, the key to, to success, not to give up, believe in, in yourself, believe into the digital transformation and just inspire people around you. Right. Well, it's very powerful and I can resonate with one comment that you made. I also run a global team and I often tell them, for me, .exe is more important than .ppt. I stop giving me those slides. Um, Michael, uh, thinking about change, sorry, yeah. there's a note. Oh, Actually, a there, the, we encourage the audience to r raise some questions on the pigeonhole, and there are some interesting questions here on the screen. Huh? Right. Um, okay, we can digress yeah. to that. But can I ask 30 seconds your answer? You've Absolutely. been a CIO in an automobile great company and in the bank. How has the role of the CIO changed over time, you think? Very quickly, 30 seconds. Oh, well, absolutely. When at at Daimler, uh, which is a car company, the the CIO was more organizing the internal processes, mm. 
Uh, so I had to do very complex systems, uh, but there was not much of touch points because the product was a car uh, or the truck. Uh, obviously, in the bank, it's totally different. In, in, in the bank, IT is a product uh, because what, what you would see as a customer is actually IT. And, and therefore, um, the, the relevance of the technology strategy in a bank is, is uh, I would say, one notch higher uh, than the technical, uh, the, the IT strategy in a, in a car. Fascinating. And that was the reason I, I actually gave up my wonderful E63 SAMG uh, <laughs> uh, for a free credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually takes me to my last question, and I'll certainly try and get to those questions, uh, Soshian. I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, people talk about internal employees and people, and I work for a bank, and the words KYC is a bad word for most clients, and banks struggle. And I tend to flip it to say KYP is more important than KYC, which is know your people. When you think about your wider people, you know, of different levels, uh, are there any nuggets of leadership that you manage to do to, to motivate them? We heard about Robin, how, how you, you know, bring them along. Yeah, so, um, and this, this is actually a, um, something I learned, not just in my current role, but in my previous roles. Uh, I mean, people are people, right? So they all have different desires, they all have different ideas of what their careers are, and uh, we can't really force people to do what they do not want to do. Right. Like Some people just say, I'm really happy at what I'm doing here, and I do not want to do anything else. And I, I think we, we need to respect that, because we need to respect that for some people, their careers is not the most important thing in their lives, right? Digital transformation is not the most important not, thing in their yeah. lives. Their family is, right? perhaps, right? They have maybe other uh, priorities in their lives. They want their children to do well in the exams, and therefore they are willing to just give up like a career a promotion uh, in order to help their children to do well in PSLE, right, in the Singapore context. So, and, and you've got to respect that. Um, and so I think what is important is to be able to figure out what the individual uh, employees want. Is it a career? Is it a better career? And how do we actually give that to them? Because if they know where they're going and, uh, uh, and they're happy with that, and that the organization is able to provide with them, then they're happy not only to just stay with the organization, but uh, have more passion and drive to, to continue the journey yeah. with it. So. Can I put some spice yeah, yeah. in the discussion? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I want to contest a little bit what you say, Sao Chong. Um, if you always give to the people what they want, you might get, get nowhere. Um, my recipe is actually a little bit more balanced. I mean, when I grew up, and I'm a little bit older generation, I'm even older than I look, yeah? so the, world, the, the sentence, oh, I'm not comfortable doing that, I mean, this doesn't exist. You were told what to do, and you did it. Yeah? Otherwise, you were out. Yeah? Um, today, that doesn't work any longer. So, <laughs> Besides having the, the work-life balance, all this kind in, in order, um, we have to give the people really hard problems to solve. The people go to places where they can add something. Yeah? Yeah. Because at the end, they still want to be significant or relevant. Everybody on its own way, but if you find the way, what the sweet spot is, what they really want to do, yeah, then they are at the right, right. The right end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I go to my technologists and, and, and say, well, um, let's uh, give them routine tasks, they would yeah. They'll go away. Yeah. They, no, they're just not I interested. Agree. They want to have the hard things to, the, the hard yeah. uh, nuts to crack. Yeah. I agree. Let me go to the audience questions. We've got six minutes to go. Uh, one of the questions, which is now not on the screen, but it's flowing, was use of data to run change management. And Benny, if you don't mind, I'll pass that to you. How do you sure. see use of data for change management? 30 seconds, please. Yeah, I, I think one is, uh, before even you get into to that question, in terms of how do you make your teams, uh, I guess, uh, make decision more data-based data, data -based and data-driven, right? I think one is, fundamentally, we need to give teams access to almost real-time data, because a lot of times, uh, I've seen in a lot of uh, customers and uh, the organization is that you give people data that's dated, right? And you expect them to make decisions that's right. forward in nature. I think one of it is to make sure that the data that we are, that the, the team are presented is actually almost real-time, if not real-time, right? And there's a lot of technology out there that's able to do that, right? To make sure that you can spin up particular instances, 
so that you can have access to that amount and right. you can classify the data and pull out the data so that they are really making decisions based on the real data that the, the organization is facing. That's a very valuable insight. You know, you can do a lot of data analytics, but if it is not real time, you're wasting your time. And that is a powerful comment. I'll go to the next question here, which says, um, Michael, I might throw this to you for 15 seconds. How do you reconcile the agile way of working within technology and the waterfall way of working on the business side? Well, uh, maybe I was misunderstood. So, so what we don't do, we, we don't have this, uh, well, separation between tech and, and, and business. So we either do stuff in full agile, that means we have hives and squads, uh, which are equipped with tech and business, or we do upfront, we know this is a project, this is an initiative which has a beginning and an end, and then everybody is, is signing up for that one. Um, in, in our bank, it was actually so that tech has started with agile development, and then we, we, we morphed it into the business side, so, so we, we started the, the revolution, right. or evolution from the, from the tech piece, and, and now uh, all the business owners, uh, the product owners are sitting in the, in the squads and, and, and right. do it. So it was started there, but now I would say it's pervasive for the, the right purposes. Right. So for the right purposes, integrated, tech is not different from business. Those are the three takeaways that I had. There was one more question, which is not on the screen on change management. Is it possible to put that question back? Because I, I missed reading that. Yes, this is real-time data coming. <laughs> Reminds me of the old acoustic coupler where the, 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 the digits came in uh, one yeah. by one. Uh, Dr. Wolfgang, uh, in your business on, on luxury segment, was change management a big deal, or is it overdone, overstated? No, it, 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 huge deal, a huge deal. Because you know, when, when we started five years ago, we were basically brick and mortar distributor, you know, uh, single category focused and doing that. And so, what we had to get get out to is to make sure that kind of the vision be painted to to say everything will be data driven, everything will be technology driven, there will be omnichannel, to make sure that people really understand what it takes and what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. and so we told them how we're going to train them up, how we're going to make sure that they, their journey and their value on the, on the market also will, will, will increase. But at the same time, it's very clear that change management, and, and that's based on experience in a lot of companies, you never get all of the people along. You know, there's always a mix. Mm -hmm. so I would say kind of if, if you get 50% of your people along, that's fantastic. I typically see th a, thir a third of the people coming along and two thirds of the people we have to change and get new people in that really drive the change. Right. I might throw one question. This is from me to the, audience, uh, to the panelists. Uh, you know, I also work for a bank. We spend a lot of time building things for our customers. Um, but one of the things I, I painfully observe is that our clients are not in a hurry to take on whatever and adopt whatever we have built for them. You know, a poor tech guy spend midnight hours and then the channels are, adopt, are, are made available, but the client adoption and client behavior changes take a long, long time. And I'll almost say it's easy to build platforms, you can't change customer behavior. So Michael, did you experience that and any nuggets? Well, I, I don't want to repeat what Robin said uh, earlier, uh, COVID helped a big, <laughs> helped big, big right. deal. So right. we saw, for example, uh, here in Singapore, seniors, uh, seniors are 50, Five and above, uh, so I'm a senior. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that one, but, but they adopted 56% more digital journeys than they did before in one quarter. Right, right. Because they had no choice. <laughs> it was a choice, yeah. <laughs> but, but actually, it worked, and now they st they, 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 they're sticking to it. Huh? Right, so that right. means that was a big uh, driver. And um, the, the other thing, it comes to data. Well, just look at the data. So if you, if you have a new service out there, then please, not only launch it with a lot of fanfare, but look how the service is consumed. You know? Right. And listen to the data. Because what, what we more often than not see, that people are afraid of looking at the data because they don't want to see the answer. You know? right, right. They want to hear the answer because the answer sometimes is, is not that it's nice. Not yeah. Yeah. Look, um, as I said at the beginning, I wish we had three hours and not 30 minutes, but whatever, 45 minutes. But thank you very much for all your comments, observations, nuggets. And I hope you got something out of this in the sense of leadership on digital transformation. I don't know if there is a feedback form, plus, but please give me some marks so that I'm invited again. This is... <laughs> <you know. laughs>
Thank you very much. Appreciate. Thank you very much. Bye. Great job. Thank you very much. Excellent panel. Big round of applause, please, for our discussion.